Hello YouTube, I'm Arn Peter, and today I'd like to talk to you about what I learned in Digital System Design. I find this to be a rather poor name for the class. After taking it, I think a much more descriptive name would be How to Build a Computer. This might be a slight exaggeration, but that's pretty much what we learned. In the beginning of the semester, we learned about passing current through wires, and then by the end of the semester, we've expanded this concept to the point where we can make a processor. The very first component we learned about is called a transistor. The way this works is you have a wire going through it and an input. By default, the transistor allows current to run through the wire, but if you apply a high voltage current to the input, then the current will not be allowed to pass through the, through the wire. This can also be thought of as a, sw as a switch. If you don't do anything to the switch, it's closed and current passes through the wire, but if you apply a high voltage current to the input, it's the equivalent of pulling the switch open and no current passes through the wire. The concept of a transistor is very simple, but they're the only component you need to build a processor. Every other component we learned about in this class is just made up of a bunch of transistors. Transistors have been a major part of computers since their inception. In 1970, computers had about 2,300 transistors in them. This number quickly increased. Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel, had an observation which was later called Moore's Law. It stated that the number of transistors in computers would double approximately every two years. Today, the processor in the phone you carry around has billions of transistors. That's an insane amount of components. These transistors are about 28 nanometers wide. A human hair is 100 micrometers wide. This means that if you were as tall as a human hair, a transistor would look about the same size as an ant from your perspective. Before I get too much further, I'd like to clarify some vocabulary. When a wire contains high voltage current, we call it high, true, or one. I'll be using these synonymously depending on situation. Likewise, when a wire contains low voltage current, we call it low, false, or zero. Again, these all mean the same thing. Now, how can we use these transistors, you may ask? Well, if you're familiar with programming, you might be familiar with AND gates. This is where you have two inputs and it only gives a true output if both the inputs are true, i.e. C is true if A and B are true. We can build something called a truth table to represent the logic of an AND gate. Each row represents a different possible combination. So as you can see, two ones for inputs result in a one for AND. However, with any other combination, the AND ends up with a value of zero. An operation which is slightly easier to implement than AND is NAND. NAND is less well known, but it's still fairly simple. NAND means not AND. So in every situation, NAND is whatever the opposite of AND is. You can see in the truth table that whenever AND is one, NAND is zero, and vice versa. This is how a NAND gate is made with transistors. We connect high voltage to the top, and we go through all co combinations of the input variables A and B to verify that this works. If A and B are both low, then both the transistors are closed and the output voltage is high. If A is low and B is high, then the transistors on the left will be closed, while the transistors on the right will be open, which still gives us a high voltage for the output. Likewise, if A is high and B is low, then current is allowed th through the right transistor but not the left, which gives us a high voltage output. For the final case, both A and B are high. Here, both the transistors are open and no current passes through, which results in nothing at the output. This is good. The circuit appears to reflect the truth table of a NAND gate. However, I oversimplified it slightly. This is only half the circuit necessary to implement a NAND gate. And to explain how to make the whole thing, we'll need some extra information. There are several different systems for setting up transistors. In this class, we learn to use CMOS transistors. Uh, CMOS stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. The metal oxide semiconductor part just tells us what it's made of, but the complementary part tells us more about how the circuits are designed. In CMOS circuits, there are actually two types of transistors which complement each other. The one I've been telling you about is actually called a P-type transistor. 
The other type is called an n-type transistor. The p-type is unique in that it's closed when low voltage current is applied to it and it's best at passing high voltage through the wire. The n-type is the opposite in that it's closed when you apply high voltage to it and it's best at passing low voltage through the wire. It can be difficult to keep these definitions straight, but with practice it gets easier. Moving back to our NAND gate, you can see we've only used p-type transistors since we're transmitting high voltage current through the circuit. In the final case of NAND, we see that no current makes it to the end of the circuit. However, no current is not the same as low voltage current. So instead of marking the output as zero, it really should be marked as Z. Z means high impedance, which happens whenever you don't have current in the wires. When making circuits, we never want to have a high impedance input or output. We want the inputs and outputs to always be either high voltage current or low voltage current. So how do we get a low voltage current for the output? Well, as I said before, we've only created half the circuit, and this half is called the pull up network. It's the half responsible for sending the high voltage current through when necessary, and is made up of only p-type transistors. We still need to add a pull down network. This half is responsible for sending the low voltage current through when necessary and is made up of only n-type transistors. Here's what it looks like after we've added the pull down network. The pull down network looks a little different from the pull up network since it's allowing current to pass through under the opposite circumstances. And n-type transistors work a little differently anyway. You can go through all the possibilities of A and B within the pull down network and see that the output of the pull down network will be high impedance when the output of NAND should be high voltage current and it will be low voltage current when the output should be low voltage current. This gives a completed NAND circuit and we managed to make it with a total of four transistors. In our circuits we want to use as few transistors as possible. Now I'm going to quickly go through a couple more fundamental circuits which we can make with transistors. I recommend that you pause the video at each circuit and try to verify the circuits by going through all the possible inputs and seeing if the outputs match up. If you're extra daring, you can pause the video before I show the circuit and try to draw it, draw it ahead of time. Another operation which is commonly used by programmers is the OR operation. Here, the output will be true if any of the inputs are true. Just as with AND and NAND, NOR is actually easier to implement than OR. So I'll be showing you NOR first. NOR has the following truth table and can also be made with four transistors. Here's what the circuit looks like. The next component we'll be making is an inverter, or as I like to call them, NOT gates. This only takes one input and the output is whatever the opposite of the input is. Here's the truth table. It can be made with two transistors and here's the circuit for it. Now that we know how to make an inverter, we can easily make an AND gate by adding an inverter to the end of a NAND gate. Likewise, we can make an OR gate by adding an inverter to the end of a NOR gate. There's one more transistor component I'd like to talk about. XOR is a logical operation that takes two inputs and will output a low voltage current if both inputs are the same, and it will output a high voltage otherwise. This takes eight transistors to create and its wiring is slightly more complicated than what we've seen with AND and OR gates. I'd like to interlude here for a second. Some of you may be, may be wondering what those bars above the variables mean. Well, if there's a bar above the variable, that means that the variable is inverted. So technically, if we were to include the transistors for the inverters, um, it would require 12 transistors to create a, a XOR gate. However, this is generally not done. We generally assume that the uh, inverted inputs are already available. This is because when you're making a circuit, you'll generally run the inputs through several gates, and uh, several of the gates require inverted inputs. So because the inverted inputs are usually used several times, they're generally only inverted once in the beginning, so that way there's no duplicate inverters in every single gate. So that is why we do not include the cost of the inverters in the transistor calculation. That's all for the components we'll be making with transistors. One thing you might be wondering is, if processors have so many transistors, how can people making the processors keep track of all of them? Well, 
They don't really need to keep track of all of them. They add layers of abstraction to the components in order to be able to work with them more easily. By that I mean instead of writing an AND gate like this, we write it like this. So we only have to think of it in terms of its inputs and outputs as opposed to all the inner wiring. Likewise, here are the symbols for all the other components we've learned. Although we don't really have to worry about transistors anymore, it's important to keep them in mind when we're making circuits. For example, here are two circuits which do the same thing. Since the right one is made with NOR and NAND gates, we prefer that one because it ends up having about 33% fewer transistors when compared to the circuit on the left. So now that we're thinking in terms of the basic operations, we can make more complicated circuits. In class, we were taught about several larger components which could be made such as decoders and multiplexers. These are all used a lot in making processors, but their applications in circuits are a little bit too abstract uh, for them to be well understood from a single video. If you're interested, I made a decoder in my Minecraft calculator series, so you can watch that to get a better idea of what it's used for. One item we learned about, which I think is slightly more interesting on its own, is an adder. An adder takes two numbers, and the output is the sum of the two numbers. We'll start with the most basic example of adding two single-digit binary numbers. I went ahead and put a link in the description about binary numbers. If you're uncomfortable with them, I'd recommend watching the video before continuing with this video. Anyway, if we work out the math of all the additions, it comes out like this. As you can see, the output is usually only a single digit, but sometimes it's two. So we'll need to have two outputs in our circuit. We'll call them S for sum and C for carry. Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can figure out how you would wire these. As a hint, try and think of it as having two sets of circuits, one for each output. Okay, let's start with the sum. This truth table might look familiar to you. It actually matches the logic for an XOR gate exactly. So we can create a circuit for the sum by only adding one XOR gate. The truth table for carry might also look familiar to you. It matches an AND gate. That said, our final circuit for adding two single digit binary numbers looks like this. This is actually called a half adder for reasons we'll be talking about later. Now let's move on to making a circuit which adds two double digit binary numbers. The process we'll use for adding these together is the same as you learned in school. We'll add the first digit, put the carry above the second digit, and then add those three digits to get our final output. Notice that we can use our half adder for the first digit, so we'll start with that. The second digit is a little more difficult since it needs to work with three numbers. Now we can see why the half adder has its name. It only does part of the job since it can't take a carry from the previous digit. So that said, our first digit can be done with a half adder, adder, but all the other ones must be done with a full adder. For the full adder, the circuit looks like this. I'll leave it to you to figure out how it works, but one thing I, I'd like to point out is that there are actually two half adders built into the circuit. Now that we know how to make a full adder, we can set up our circuit for adding two two-digit numbers like this. This can be extended to any amount of digits by simply adding more full adders to what we have now. One thing I find interesting about having layers of abstraction is that as long as the input and output of the components remain consistent, you can implement the lower level with whatever you want. Here I made the basic logical components with transistors. However, when I made an adder in Minecraft, I implemented the basic logical components with redstone. There's also a very interesting video which features making an adder with dominoes. There will be a link in the description to that if you're interested. Anyway, that's all for today. I hope you found this content interesting, and I look forward to sharing more of what I'm learning with you at another time.